again, I don't think it's fair to say that there haven't been intellectual stalwarts, Raul Prebish, Havili Sapila, or Robert Jackson and Joe Nasty on the, uh, on the operational side. The selection criteria for senior appointments, in my view, has increasingly been based on nationality rather than an experienced track record and an ability to do the job. Now, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised, but it doesn't strike me that these positions should provide on-the-job training, that political considerations should not trump competence. So why, why do I think this is important? Well, 90% of the world organization's expenditures are for its employees. Therefore, if you wanted to do something to reinvigorate the institution, in my view, you could actually do this. Perhaps not quickly, but you could do it. So this will, uh, I do not agree with Susan Strange and Robert Cox, who gave this talk in 1992, who would argue that the views from the inside of a secretariat can only be orthodox, can only sustain the status quo of the, of the current order. I really have a different view. It seems to me that the, this international service, properly constituted, can and could make a difference. It seems to me that the examples that one could pull out of ignoring standard bureaucratic operating procedures, you have to be willing to run risk, you have to make waves. I think the best historical example was um, actually a very short-term assignment by his former U.S. Congressman Brad Morris, who became the, uh, the uh, UNDP administrator, and Maurice Strong, who headed up something called the uh, Office of Emergency Operations in Africa in the mid-1970s. Quickly, they put this together virtually overnight. They broke all the rules for recruitment. They broke all the rules for relating to governments, and it moved ahead. It seems to me that if you look back to the career of somebody like Sir Robert Jackson, the same kinds of things he did in the Mediterranean during the Second World War as a uh, naval logistics guy, he then put in UNRWA and in the Bangladesh emergency. Now, the high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change, among the other mice that they hatched, was a look at the civil service. And their proposal, which reiterates proposals made over the time, was a one-time buyout to get rid of Deadwood. Well, nothing is happening on this proposal, but I don't think the proposal ad addresses the problem. Frankly, if you had a buyout, the good people would leave because they'd have options. The real Deadwood would stay because they couldn't go anything else. So my proposition relates to how do you gather new wood, not how do you get the best, brightest, youngest folks hired and promoted and then out of the organization. So my proposal here is to go back to, as I said, the idealistic origins, the theory that was devote, developed during the League of Nations. Competence should be the highest consideration, not geographical origins, not gender, not age and every other rationale that comes up for cronyism within recruitment offices. At a minimum, the take it or leave it approach for, for the senior post, which are reserved for particular nationalities, has to change so that one would name three or four or five candidates and the choice would then be left to the secretariat. That would be an interim step. I think as in domestic situations, it's a fallacy to argue that quality must suffer while we're trying to get a qualified and diverse secretariat. Lots of recruitment efforts can be made, including having standardized exams, which are no, not standardized. They change per region and country. Um, to, the real requirement here is try to limit influence and patronage from governments, north, south, east, west, and every way you cut it. The beginning of a term for a secretary general is usually a good time to at least make some changes. Annan did this in 97 and again in 2002, just as Boutros did it in 1992. The current Secretary General made no such effort, which is not surprising. Um, and moreover, the clash, the futile clash between South and North at the end of Annan's term stalled consideration of sensible proposals to place more budgetary authority on the 38th floor. A relatively small number of countries said, oh, we don't want decision making to move to the secretariat. This is going to be somehow manipulated by the North. It has to be uh, left in the GA. 
In fact, Mark Malik Brown, when he gave this lecture in 1997, said, and I'm going to quote, taking a demotion to come over from UNDP to be Annan's chief of staff was a much bigger step down than I anticipated. I found when it came to management and budgetary matters, he was less influential than I had been. So if the UN is going to move ahead, it needs better personnel and it needs more responsibility at the top to determine uh, what goes well. Let me just pick up a few examples of things that have mo moved ahead modestly, once again, from these three areas. On, and the problems I discussed earlier of uh, sexual misconduct, uh, the best that's happened is that Prince Zaid actually came out with a pretty hard-hitting report. Once again, not much has happened. But what needs in this kind of arena for discipline to happen is that the U it has to be a, a kind of international UN discipline. Troops are still only responsible to their national authorities. So if anything happens, they may be sent back home. They may be left where they are. So not much has happened there. I mentioned very little on the gender front. In fact, certain member countries are far ahead of the UN in any way you measure it. Um, uh, for instance, Liberia, after Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was elected the first woman head of state in Africa, she's now named in no particular order ministers of defense, women, who, ministers of defense, finance, sports, youth, justice, commerce, chief of police, president of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It seems to me that the UN has a lot of catching up to do in relationships of some governments in this respect. I think in the human rights arena, there have been more examples uh, of what might happen. Um, my thoughts here revolve around using more outsiders, insisting upon an obligatory field rotation, and issuing fewer permanent contracts to people who work in this arena. As I look at the human rights arena, uh, the, the tendency to avoid any kind of confrontation not, not even robust, but even a gentle variety is often shied away from. One of the solutions, and I, I was actually speaking to a couple of people earlier today about this, the one that I've analyzed in some depth involves work on internally displaced persons by Francis Deng and Roberta Cohen. Um, because Deng was not inside the UN, he had a blue hat when he wanted it, but he was mainly outside. He was mainly working at the Brookings Institution. My own evaluation of, of his both legal and conceptual s steps forward around the notion of state sovereignty and internally displaced persons and the whole launching of the responsibility to protect bait reflects the fact that he, was, he had a foot in two camps. He was inside when he wanted to be inside, but he was outside most of the time. He had soft money. Uh, and his base at a public policy think tank and working in tandem with academics provided uh, a respectable distance from governments and the kind of political pressure that he comes under now that he's totally in the UN as the special advisor on genocide. He has his, his sort of room for maneuvers totally circumscribed and he is, uh, in my view, uh, much quieter than he needs to be. Moreover, because he raised money that was not, it, some of it was from governments, but these governments or foundations expected uh, for him and his team to push out what passes for conventional wisdom and not accept the usual diplomatic pablum. So it seems to me this role of outside insider or inside outsider offers real advantages that should be replicated for other issues when independent research uh, instant, where their independent research is required, institutional barriers are high, normative exas, uh, gaps exist, and political hostility is widespread. Second, it seems to me that one of the uh, largest sources of internal morale being low revolves around the fact that promotions are really based on um, your contacts in headquarters, your performance in headquarters when the work is really in the field. 